Grand Prix, a small world of fierce competition, of danger, and for the winner, of great rewards. Few people can succeed in this competition. One of the few who has is Colin Chapman. At 40, he's made his million out of cars, a success which has sprung directly from the racing circuits of the world. Motor racing is usually an expensive hobby for the rich amateur or a showplace for the large manufacturer. Chapman is neither, yet his cars have twice won the Grand Prix World Championship. And here, at the German Grand Prix at Nürburgring, he's leading again, the season already two-thirds through. But Chapman is a revolutionary in the strictly technical world of cars. He's a man who produces innovation after innovation for his thoroughbred machines. He's one of Britain's new generation of technocrats, super specialists in the narrow world. His favourite phrase is, fittingly, there are no mysteries. No one can make much money out of racing, but the name Chapman's racing cars bear is so illustrious that he's built a sports car business on it. The name is Lotus. Chapman opened his new Lotus factory in Norfolk two years ago. It cost more than a million pounds. Yet he started 15 years ago with only a 25 pound loan from his girlfriend, tinkering with a second-hand engine. How did he break through? His father was completely non-technical and kept a pub in North London. But after ordinary secondary school, Chapman was sent to London University, where he got a civil engineering degree, second class. He had a year in the Air Force, then joined a large aluminium firm. But privately, he was indulging his real passion, cars. He called his first car Lotus, a surprisingly poetic name for the machine, but drawn, he now tells us, from the name on a bathroom fitting. <laughs> well, now, what are we doing about this then? Uh, uh, have, we, have we definitely got lots of people to buy these? these things? Oh, yeah. At first, he prepared small second-hand cars for himself to race, but soon Lotus began to be known as a winner, and Chapman made his own name as a driver. Other people asked him to build cars for them, and since his racing was expensive, he began to sell cars from his garage come factory. The breakthrough came nine years ago with his first proper production car, the Lotus Elite. Now, only 15 years from the start, Chapman has made it. And from his brand new factory, he'll sell 3,000 cars this year, perhaps 5,000 in two years' time. Mr Chapman, you've come an awful long way. How much are you now worth? Oh, I, I really couldn't say. I haven't really stopped to work it out. We're busy developing Lotuses and uh, Lotus companies and growing and I'm more interested in the technical side of it. We did uh, gross over three million pounds worth of turnover last year, and I'm estimating around four million this year, I should think. Well, it certainly makes you a millionaire anyway. Ah, uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. Did you have any great strokes of luck? I think uh, you have to have the right opportunities, most certainly. I, I don't know that luck really comes into it. I think it's more a question of seizing the opportunities that present themselves. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities that, that come one's way that uh, you realise afterwards that um, perhaps you didn't seize them quickly enough. But to do a business like this, don't you have to be pretty ruthless? Um, I don't think you have to be ruthless. I, I think you have to be prepared to make some unpalatable decisions at times, because frequently you're faced with making a decision between two evils and, and you're going to hurt somebody. And this is the, this is the tragedy of... of uh, trying to run a business that you do end up making unpalatable decisions sometimes but there's no there's no way out frequently do you think anybody else could now set out and do what you've done i think there will always be a a, a case for a, a relatively small virile adaptable business to uh, fill in the gaps that must exist when you've got big business like the big car manufacturers fulfilling a, a mass market. There's always going to be scope for the man who can offer something better, uh, something different. And this is what we intend to do. Turning to racing, 
does racing really help you to develop your cars or is it advertising and publicity? Uh, we mainly go racing because I like it. Um, I like going racing. I've always been involved in racing. I like the competitiveness of it. I like the comradeship of it. And I also like the te technical fallout that comes from it. Uh, we do learn a tremendous amount from racing. Our engineers in the, in the car company can take direct um, read-offs from our racing cars to our production cars in terms of suspension, handling, and safety. We stress everything to the limit on our race cars. We, we find out just what a part will do and well, how much it will stand, and then we then know what sort of safety limit we can incorporate in our production cars. Making cars is usually a business for giant organisations. Making them in small numbers, cheaply enough to sell, is much more difficult. The cars have to be made largely from other firms' components. Indeed, Chapman uses parts from all over the industry, though he does now make his own bodies, from fibreglass, since metal would be far too expensive on this scale. But what counts, what justifies his brand name, is the design. It's here, in design, that Chapman's single-minded technical skill is outstanding. His most basic contribution is in suspension and chassis design. There's even a part known to the car world as the Chapman strut. The move to Norfolk was a typical Chapman gamble, breaking away from London to a disused aerodrome in an agricultural area. There, there was space, above all room for a private test track. Typical also was how he found the site. He drew a circle on the map, a hundred miles radius from London. Then he got into a plane and flew himself round until he found what he wanted. Production cars now produce the big money, but racing cars proper are still a business for Chapman. He sells more than a hundred a year. His own racing operation is Team Lotus, for which Graham Hill is now the top driver. Hill began his racing with Chapman, working as a Lotus mechanic in return for cars to drive. What's Colin like? Is he a hard taskmaster to his drivers? Um, oh, yes and no. I mean, he, he doesn't actually drive you. He doesn't, I mean, which wouldn't work anyway, I don't think. And I think he appreciates that. But the sort of standard he sets um, for himself and his own mechanics more or less sets the tone. And of course, you've got to come up to that anyway. And uh, consequently, um, through by example, you get, um, you get the standard set, which of course is a very high one. What's his real <coughs> contribution to motor racing? Original thinking, and uh, which <coughs> is very unusual. I mean, that's most things have been done before. And of course, his, um, his design and, uh, and his speed at getting things done, and of course, his energy and drive and personality. Uh, you know, there's a, one can number quite a few things, but I think original thinking in motor racing, more or less setting the setting the, the pace of uh, design um, improvement and progress in motor racing. A racing car is, simply, something to get an engine round a circuit as quickly as possible, while keeping its wheels stuck to the track. The specifications are strict, but Chapman's talent has been to develop his cars to the limit of what is allowed. With the monocoque body, he was the first to sit the driver, in effect, in the middle of the petrol tank, thus saving space and weight. Now he's developing the wedge-shaped aerodynamic body. With this jet engine wedge, he took on the Americans at Indianapolis this year. He'd already won the American Classic in 1965, the first British constructor ever to do so. I was horrified to see the way that the design of cars had stagnated over there, and, and so far as they just hadn't had the spur of competition that we'd had in Europe to evolve newer and better cars. And really, I felt that all we needed to do was to take a European-style car to the state which we'd already evolved our racing car in Europe and take it to America, and it would be successful. Added to which, of course, the, the attitude in America was goaded us on a bit insofar as that they felt that uh, the only sort of racing was Indianapolis-type racing, and that all this Grand Prix racing was just fun for the boys. But when we won the race, they all started to copy this 
style immediately. And in fact, all American race cars now are based on the European style of race car. You go over to America a lot. Have you learned anything from American business methods? I don't think that in particular the Americans have that much better ideas on business than can be found in the good firms in England. They do business on a larger scale, but um, a lot of their um, reputation is a bit of a myth, I feel. What is this, public relations or are they more public conscious? You're fairly public conscious. I think they're very good at patting themselves on the back, whereas the British tend to criticise themselves all the time and more often. But if you compare the actual results achieved, I don't think there's all that much difference. The Americans think that there's much less government interference than there is in, in, uh, in Britain, for instance, with businessmen. Do you feel this? Do you feel that the load of, of the government machine is down in your neck the whole time? I feel we could do with a far less government interference than we have in, in Britain at the moment. Not so much direct with, with businesses as, as with people. I feel that, that we're far too over-regulated. Um, I feel that the, the unions are far too restrictive, that everyone takes a negative look instead of a positive look at the problem. And they still harp back too much on the bad old days. And I feel that these, in any enlightened society, these are gone forever, and what we should be doing now is looking to seizing opportunities, creating opportunities, and, and fostering progress, rather than trying to uh, restrict everything down to a, a negative uh, approach, which is what's happening now. And yet you're something of a nationalist. You carry Racing for Britain on your, on your vans and on your cars, and you have made your own, su your own success here in Britain. How um, do you feel when you go abroad and come back? What do you feel well, about Britain? Well, <clears throat> the, the net result of spending 10 years traveling to most countries in the world racing makes me realize what a wonderful place Britain is and how pleased I am to come back to it. There was another advantage in moving Lotus to a Norfolk aerodrome. Chapman has his own plane. This is one of the luxuries that wealth allows him and one of the few hobbies away from cars that he allows himself. Another is the holiday home in Ibiza to which he flies himself direct. This delight in flying is again typical. A technical challenge, a skill and a means of saving time. essential for the amount of travelling that I find necessary in connection with the business and racing. Uh, being placed 100 miles from London as we are, uh, it's handy to be able to get into London uh, in a total of about an hour, which involves about half an hour's flying time. And of course it's easy to get to the continent. Uh, I can be in Amsterdam within three quarters of an hour of leaving my office. And this is really necessary in order to uh, cope with the um, amount of business that we do nowadays. Hey, there's our transporter leaving them. See our red and white transporter. He flew to Rouen for the French Grand Prix in July, the sixth of this year's 12 championship races. As always, Chapman was experimenting, this time with the revolutionary aerofile. Morning, back on. Yes, I should think so. Yeah, if you can, if you can, if you can get it on on time. Um, well, I don't know whether we're going to. Well, see, we got, yes, we, we might. We've got it's, ten minutes. Yes. Well, have a go. See if you can get it back on in time.
Well, you're about half a second slower than Rent and Stuart at the moment. Why don't you just do one run? Just do one run and see what it's like. Winning motor races is a matter of gaining mere seconds, and it's here that the new ideas count. A novel technique like the aerofile, if successful, is quickly taken up by all competitors. But at the moment, it's still an experiment, which may produce its own problems. The aerofoil is designed to force the car down on the road to help it corner. But Chapman and Hill had had a run of transmission failures. Were these the result of new strains imposed by the inverted wing? Yeah. Well, maybe we could set the slow running up a bit to stop there. Yeah, Can we set the slow running up a sniff? How difficult is that? <coughs> oh, I know, we'll do that in the paddock. Right, you can get out again now. Is it all back on? Right, it's all back on again. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. <laughs> Isn't it quick? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, they've got a magic device now, you see. They're... You're going to get time for about two laps. There's perpetual danger in all this speed and experiment. Everything is stressed to the limit, is run to the edge of safety. Hill's troubles were nothing to those of the other Lotus driver at Rouen. Jackie Oliver had a monumental crash in practice and his car was completely torn to pieces. He had a miraculous escape. Better, uh, can you bring Graham in? Give him the in signal. No, well, let's have him in again. Oh, dear me. Cool, you were white. You're, you're better now. You were pretty white from 10 minutes ago. I think you ought to sit down. And Sit down in the, in the chair. Oh, bad, really? Saw that wall coming up. Sure, right, Well, what else could it be? Did you? You didn't hit anything, did you? You, didn't, you haven't actually hit anything all the time. No, no, it didn't hit anything. All I've done was fun of the hair. You see, the whole of the whole of the rear suspension is in fact hung on that gearbox. And if that breaks, well, that's it. But then they're all on the same basis. Hey, Bruce, look, I think I better tell you, the gearbox bell housing broke, and you know the whole of our rear suspension is hung on the gearbox, same as yours. And it's just broken in half in the middle. You know, the bell housing's got a hell of a load in it, if you think about it. That's all that's happened, it's just broken in half. I'm bringing Graham in and not going to run him like that. You better have a look and see if there's any cracks in your bell housing. You think we all don't know, man? Chapman's first theory about the accident in the heat of the moment was wrong. It was nothing to do with the gearbox. But now he, the designer, had £18,000 worth of junk metal to examine. Any idea at all, Mr Chapman, what might have caused it? Haven't a clue at the moment. Very early days to say. We'll have to have a look and see if anything, you know, if we can see anything obvious. It looks as if the body held together very well, the, the monocot. Monocot, save me. Yeah. Mm. See, all these things are just straightforward tension. See that one? This thing is just pulled straight off, yeah. tighten the head with it, look. Mm. <laughs> what was happening? Were you going straight when it happened? Yes, it was straight on. You can see where the skid marks are up there. And then what, what do you know? You were going backwards, suddenly. Well, it moved funnily across the road towards the right. Um, and then it just went, just spun, just went and started to go backwards. But it didn't spin completely, it only went halfway. And then started to go backwards. And then it went the whole turn again. And the next thing I saw was the wall here. You hit the wall, is that what stopped you? Well, it didn't stop me, yeah, quite enough. But I bounced off and ended up this way and then jumped out. Oliver was all right. But the agony for a designer like Chapman is that things do go wrong. This spring, Mike Spence was killed in a Lotus and the master driver, Jim Clark. I did get very, very close to Jim Clark. He was, I would say, my best friend, best friend I've ever had. Uh, we got on terribly well together. I understood 
exactly what he wanted and so on, and I think he understood exactly what I meant when we, were, when we conversed on the subject. Plus, we were very good friends off the track. Jimmy was, in my opinion, probably the greatest racing driver there's ever been. He's been a very rare combination of a, a fantastically high intellect, a fantastically high ability, with a tremendous concentration. And I don't think there are any other drivers that, uh, in, in my experience of Grand Prix racing over the last 10 years, have, have ever equaled or ever likely to equal the sort of a, a total a race driver concept that Jimmy was. And this is the tra tragedy of motor racing, is when you do get close to a driver and there is an accident, of course, it, it hurts you so much more. A racing driver's life is in the hands of the designer, but also in those of the mechanics. They are the third strand in this tiny, close-knit world. What's Chapman like to work for? Um, exacting. Uh, reasonable in the main, I think. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to uh, uh, be completely reasonable with the amount of work you've got to cover. Sometimes people are working very late hours and there's lots of work to do, but it must be done if you expect to win. Is he easier to get on with when you're winning? What happens when you start having a losing streak? I think he's easier to get on with uh, when we're losing, actually. Seems, you know, to try and uh, ease you on and help you along. It's quite reasonable. Has he got a temper? Uh, yes, yes, he's got a definite temper. He doesn't lose it very often, though. It has to be something fairly stupid or severe to get him really going. On the day of a Grand Prix, the private technical life of men like Chapman is invaded temporarily by the enthusiast, by glamour. The atmosphere is international, sometimes zany. Honda's team had their Japanese lunch flown from Paris. Though he's now a manufacturing tycoon, Chapman is still hooked on this small, competitive racing fraternity. Other manufacturers like Mercedes and even for a time Ferrari have pulled out of it. Racing doesn't pay by itself, good advertising as victory can be. But Chapman goes on, win or lose. There's tremendous excitement and, and tension and atmosphere in racing. Um, I must admit it's a terribly disappointing sport to take part in because there's 18 or 20 cars go out for the race, only one of them can ever win. But after a while you begin to realise that this is the pattern of it and that um, you all have your share of good times and you have your share of your bad times and they're roughly in the ratio of 18 to 1. Colin, how do you fancy the chances? It's starting to rain. Yes, well, it's one of these problem days where we're not quite sure whether it's going to rain or not. Um, I don't think it'll come on heavy rain, and uh, in light rain, I think the tyres we're using are as good as any that we've got. Although I must admit that um, I'd feel a lot happier if we had a tyre that worked better in the wet. Mm. How do you feel personally at this moment? Do you, are you highly nervous? I always get a little nervous, yeah. I always hope it's all going to stay together. You know, there's so many things that can go wrong with a racing car that uh, the unusual one really is the one that finishes rather than the one that doesn't. There is tremendous tension at the start of the race because this is what we've all been working for. This is what all the mechanics have slaved away many, many hours in the garages and what we've all worked on the drawing boards and so on to get this car to the starting line. And this is going to be the, the moment when we find out whether all the things we think are going to work are in fact going to work. 
The drivers, of course, are quite tense because they realise that in a few moments they're going to be involved in a very high-speed procession down through that first corner where every man has to be very, very careful to make sure that he doesn't touch another car and precipitate a multiple accident and so on. Um, I'm sure Graham will do his best. Keep it going. It's amazing. Chapman won no prizes at Rouen. In fact, the race was something of a disaster and Hill broke down again. But even at home, Chapman doesn't get away from cars. The technical man par excellence, he hasn't really got many interests outside the technical. He keeps fit, is weight conscious, but he's always designing something. Nor does he take time to indulge in his new wealth. Predictably, he's got a lot of cars, seven of them. But otherwise, he doesn't spend with a millionaire's abandon. His one big new venture is the £40,000 house he's building. In a way, it's like Chapman himself. Modern inside, but outside conservative. Chapman prefers, he says, something enduring. Come on, Clyde, now. Do something, Clyde. Come on, off. Let me have a go. Come on, Chapman. Come on, Chapman. Come on, Chapman. Until the new house is finished, the Chapman family lives simply, if comfortably. No servants, just a no-pair girl. Mrs Chapman is used to making her own curtains and does the cooking. It was she who lent him that £25 that got him started on his way to become a millionaire. How does she think the success has changed her husband? Well, to me, I think he's uh, a better person for it. He's uh, a lot more tolerant now and understanding of people and uh, he's more interested in other people. And I think it's, uh, whether it's just uh, he's getting older and people improve that way, I don't know. But uh, I think he's better for it. Now, has it changed your life if you suddenly got building a great big house in the new house. Do you find that having come to a great deal of money, does this change your life a lot? No, I don't think we've changed at all, really. I think um, we've always had to work hard for what we've got, and I think that, in a way, has made us appreciate things a great deal more now. And uh, I think, uh, really, we, we enjoy quite simple things. Would you like him to let off the pressure and to relax and you just to relax into a quieter life? Um, well, I wouldn't like him to relax too much because uh, I think um, it's better for a husband and wife to uh, have times together and times apart. I find that's worked very well. And um, I don't really ever think Colin would ever retire or relax completely. He's got to have something to occupy him. He's that sort of a person. Now you've become a millionaire. What difference has it made to your life? Um, you laugh every time I say you're a millionaire, but you Well, are. no one's ever said it before, so <laughs> I haven't really got used to the idea, even if that is true. It's still a shock to you to think of yourself as a millionaire? Um, I think so, yes. No one's ever said that uh, they thought I was a millionaire, and I don't really know that I am, actually. I'm going to say I have a very good company, uh, but I don't... Uh, no one's valued it yet, so I don't really know just what, uh, what it's worth. Um, I forgot what your question was now. <laughs> when you look coming up to the present and you were amused at the thought you were now a millionaire, it's been a very rapid change. What has that difference has that made to your life? Well, it hasn't made any difference, really, as I've said, because I haven't really, hasn't really sunk in yet. 
Um, all I really notice is that uh, with the work I do, working during the week at the business and weekends racing, leaves me very little spare time. And this is the one facet of, of my current existence which rather disappoints me. I would like to spend more time at home and more time with my children. Have you ever had much time there? I wouldn't have thought you were a man who rested much. Oh, no, I don't rest much even when I'm at home. I'm always doing something and, and chasing around or, or uh, drawing or designing or doing something. But at least I'm at home, whereas I spend so much time away, this is rather disappointing. But you've now become a, a super tycoon or a tycoon. How do you look on the, the older established tycoons who you find uh, around in English society? Do you think English society needs to be jazzed up a good deal? I think there should be more opportunities for people to show their true worth. And I don't think that it should just be going on their education or their social background. I think there is a tremendous amount of good in, in most people. And uh, you can't uh, classify people as to whether they're going to be successful or whether or not. I do think that a university education is a great benefit to, to uh, future life, not so much as what you learn, as just the, the training for thinking and the training for reasoning and questioning everything that's gone before. The man I don't like is the expert who has pedantic views on what can be done and what can't be done, because in nine cases out of ten they're wrong. Do you see yourself relaxing more now, now you've made it? I <laughs> let's say I haven't adjusted myself to this fact that I've made it, but I don't see there's any point in relaxing at the moment. I, we have a tremendous challenge ahead of us. We've got a lot of new ideas coming through the development shops at the moment, new cars, and uh, I can't see any scope for relaxation for the next four or five years, at least. Well, there is one change. There's your new house, which is going to be a magnificent place. This is a rather different way of living to what you lived before, isn't it? Uh, it's, a, it's an objective. I always have to have uh, an objective and, and preferably some sort of hobby or something other than motoring and motor cars, because you can get terribly stale if you do nothing but motor cars. And flying has always been very interesting to me. I like flying. I fly my own aeroplane to most of the races and so on. It, it, and uh, I, I must say I've got a lot of fun out of uh, designing and developing this house and the grounds that go with it. And uh, I think it's a jolly good hobby. And I shall enjoy that for a few more years yet. Yeah. You seem to be constantly giving yourself problems to solve. Are you a competitive man? How do you mean a competitive man? I always like to succeed at anything I try to do, and I always, uh, always feel that, um, yes, I suppose I am. I always like to try to do anything better that, than I see it being done before. Colin Chapman, the competitive man, has made his million out of cars, but his wealth hasn't changed him much. He's conservative, patriotic. His pleasures are still as they've always been, in the tackling of technical problems. He's partly a standard British type, but he's also a trailblazer in this modern, machine-dominated world. For such a man, motor racing, which is invention fired by competition, makes the perfect arena. For Chapman, it's more than the springboard to a fortune, more than a mere testbed for new ideas. To Colin Chapman, millionaire, Grand Prix is both a challenge and a fulfilment. I think if you try hard enough at racing, uh, you should always be able to win your share of races. I don't think that it is beneficial for anybody if, if any one team won all the races. Um, we want to win a third of them if we can, and if we don't, it's only because we don't try hard enough.